But in that day in the resurrection, death is swallowed up in victory. Death loses its sting. This morning we are in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. We're continuing this three-week series uh, for this Christmas time, this series called God's Gospel Gifts. This is the third installment of that series. And what we have done is gone to various passages and, and looked, one passage each week, and we have looked at the gifts that God has given to us in Christ Jesus, through Christ Jesus, through his good news, through the gospel of his suffering on our behalf, his resurrection from the dead, and his ascension to heaven and ultimately his return to receive us unto himself. God is the best gift giver. God is the best gift giver. If we think that the forgiveness of our sins is the extent of the gospel, friends, we have failed to unpack the rest of the gifts. We have failed to understand just how much God has given us through his son Jesus. In fact, three sermons on this doesn't really, uh, doesn't really do it any sort of sufficiency. It gives us a taste for the things that God has promised us through Jesus. So this morning we're continuing that. Let me remind you of what we've looked at the last couple of weeks, a number of gifts that we've looked at God giving us in Galatians chapter 4. Verses 1 through 7, remember this, God has given us redemption through the blood of Jesus, meaning he has paid for our sins through the death of Christ on the cross, and by Jesus' righteous life and his sacrificial death, God has purchased us from the slave market, the death market of sin. We have received from God through Jesus the redemption of our souls. We have received not only redemption, we have been brought into to the household of God, not as slaves, but as sons and daughters. We have been adopted into his family. Not only that, we have been filled, possessed by his Holy Spirit who has sealed us for the day of redemption. He has sealed us as the guarantee of our inheritance until we take possession of it one day. And then ultimately, God has given us position as heirs of himself. The position as heirs of himself. All that was just from one text of scripture. Galatians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 2. Let me remind you what God has given us. In Christ, God has made us complete. We saw that the fullness of deity dwells in Jesus bodily, and through Jesus, God has filled us. God has made us complete. We who were once alienated from God, hostile towards him, not, not benefiting from his promises, not going to inherit eternal life. No, now we have been filled with the fullness of God. Not only that, we've been made brand new. We've been made brand new. That means the old self has been mortified. He or she has been put to death, and the new self, amen, sister, and the new self has been made in the image of Christ. If any man is in Christ, he is a, say it, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, all things have become new. You have been made complete. You've been made brand new. Your trespasses have been forgiven. And let me throw this in there because the apostle Paul does. Our enemy has been defeated. Satan, amen. I'm going to have to get used to this. <laughs> Satan has been triumphed over by Christ on the cross. Paul says that, that Christ put Satan to open humiliation and he stripped off his armor, he stripped off his weaponry, that, that claim to condemnation that the devil used to be able to hang over our heads because we are guilty as sin. Christ removed that because there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. This is a good Christmas, isn't it? These are some incredible, unparalleled gifts that God has given us. You know, God knows how to just continually sweeten the pot, too. God knows how to just continually make it, make it better and better, to bring this full plan of redemption all the way around. This morning, 
In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18, let me summarize the entirety of the message for you here. Through Jesus and his promise of resurrection, our sorrow is seasoned with hope and our hearts are full of courage. Through Jesus and his promise of resurrection, our sorrow is seasoned with hope. What kind of sorrow? All sorrow. It's seasoned with hope. It's not devastating to us. It's not destroying to us. It's not crushing. It may be perplexing, but it is seasoned with hope. And our hearts, therefore, can be full of encourage. We live in a dark world. We live in a difficult world. We, we live in a world where a seemingly healthy human being can just not wake up one morning and just pass into eternity. We live in a world where someone who is seemingly the picture of health one day can the next day be diagnosed with an extremely aggressive cancer and that cancer take them down moment by moment until it finally claims their life. And yet this sorrow that we feel is seasoned with hope. Amen. You turn me down just a little bit, I'm echoing. This sorrow is seasoned with a futuristic look at the promise of God and a realization that God will raise us from the dead. Not only us, but those who are in Christ who have died before us. God will raise them from the dead. I know that for many, and I would even say for all of us, the holidays, they're joyful, but they can be difficult, can't they? They can be difficult because you begin to think about those who you deeply loved, and they're not here anymore, but you still love them. And they're not with you anymore presently, but they're with you emotionally. They're with you in your heart. You love them. You long to see them. You long to give them a call and hear their voice, but it's just, it's not going to happen right now. But that sorrow, if that sorrow consumes you, let me tell you, it's not because God has not given you a remedy for it. It's because you are ignorant of the remedy he has given. Paul tells the Thessalonians back there, just a, just a paragraph above, starting there in verse 9. He says, concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you. You yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. You know this. Your theology about a familial love for one another, now you've got that down. You know that truth. But maybe one of the first and only kind of rebukes that Paul has for the Thessalonian Christians comes there in verse 13 through 18. There seems to be some sort of deficiency in their theology that would cause them to grieve as people who have no hope. It would cause them to be crushed by their grief. And Paul wants to make sure that the people of God believe right and feel right and think right and thank God rightly. Paul wants to make sure that they understand the fullness of the promises of God. In this passage of Scripture, what you're going to see is four gifts that God gives us through Jesus and his promise of resurrection. Four gifts that God gives us through Jesus and his promise of resurrection. That first gift will be overwhelming. Verses 13 through 16 is where it comes from. So let's look at that together. Paul says, but we do not want you to be ignorant. We don't want you to be uninformed. You, you're not uninformed about brotherly love, but we want to make sure that you are not uninformed, brothers, about those who are, strangely enough, he says, those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. Isn't that fascinating? That, that Paul uses the, the word 
koimao, not thanatos. He uses the term sleep, not the term dead. Dead seems to sound permanent, doesn't it? Sleeping sounds temporary. And I believe Paul is not speaking euphemistically. We speak euphemisms when we try to make something that's difficult sound a little bit sweeter. Oh, we were, we were just, we were going through a rough patch. Going through a rough patch. What does that mean? It can mean a lot of things, can it? That's a euphemism. Uh, Paul's not using a, a euphemism here. Paul is actually referring specifically to a temporary state of being for those who are in Christ Jesus. We don't want you to be ignorant, brothers, about those who have fallen asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. Paul talks about the, the sleep of a believer in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 20 through 23. This will be on the board for you if you want to follow along. Paul says, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through one man, that is Adam, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For as in Adam our father all die, so in Christ all will be made alive, but each in his turn. Christ the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. So he says that Christ is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Christ being dead and buried in the ground for three days was raised up from the dead. Was he literally dead? Yes, he was. Do people who die in Christ literally die? Yes, they absolutely do. It is not that their souls go to sleep. It is not that they black out. It is not though they feign death. They do actually and literally die, but it is the power of God to make death a temporary state. It is the power of God to wake someone from the sleep of death. Paul says, I don't want you to be ignorant about this. You wouldn't think of this in your own mind. I mean, this is so miraculous, you would never come up with this on your own. So I don't want you to be ignorant about that. Listen to how Paul describes this resurrection from the dead. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that same chapter, starting in verse 51. Paul says, listen, I tell you a mystery. For we will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed for the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. He gives us the victory. So when, when is death swallowed up in victory? When is this sorrow transferred and changed to joy? Not right now. It's not changed to joy just yet. Our sorrow is seasoned with hope, but one day our sorrow will be changed to joy. It will be changed to joy on the day of the return of Christ and the resurrection of the dead. Paul says that, that Jesus is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So I want you to listen to what Jesus said about his own death when speaking to the disciples. John chapter 16, verse 20, Jesus says to his disciples, truly, truly, I say to you, you will, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. He's talking about his own crucifixion. He says, you will weep and lament. Isn't that what we do when a, a loved one dies? We weep. We grieve. 
We lament that person's death and their passing, and we feel that deeply. If we didn't feel it deeply, it would mean that we did not love deeply. It would mean that there's something calloused inside of us. It's not wrong to grieve. It's not wrong to lament. But it's, it is wrong to not have your sorrow seasoned with hope. It, it shows an ignorance. It shows an immaturity in your knowledge of the promises of God for sorrow to not be seasoned with hope. That's what Paul says. He says, you don't, we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. He doesn't say that you may not grieve. He doesn't say that if you believe in Christ and the resurrection of the dead, you won't grieve. No, you'll still weep, and you'll be sorrowful, and you will lament at those people's death, our loved one's death. But he says, I don't want you to do it with no hope. That's the caveat. So Paul is going to tell us something here. He's going to tell us a number of some things here that are going to season our sorrows with hope, with a living hope. So listen to how Paul does this. He says, verse 8, 14, For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. He says there is a correlation between believing in Jesus and this promise of resurrection. If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, then we also believe and affirm this, that Jesus will raise those who are in him by faith. He will raise them up from the dead. This makes us to be a hope-filled people. We ought not be despondent all the time. We ought not be depressed all the time. We ought not be cast down and, and act like we're destroyed all the time. If that's the case, it's that we're doubting, not believing, or just plain ignorant about the promises of God. Our lack of hope characterized us when we were outside of Christ. Our lack of hope characterized us when we were far from God. Listen to how Paul describes this, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 12 through 13. Paul says, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ, you who were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. People who are in Christ are characterized by hope. It doesn't mean that we don't grieve. It doesn't mean that we don't feel deep sorrow. In fact, when a loved one dies, when a person who is close to us dies, it should remind us that the death that we experience in this life is a very real consequence of the sin of mankind. It is God making good on his promise. In the day that you eat of it, dying you will surely die. And because we are all born of Adam, so also in Adam's likeness we die. But if you have been born again, if you have believed in Jesus with all your heart, then just as Jesus died and was raised from the dead, God has also promised to raise you. And that promise ought to give you indomitable, indestructible hope, even in the midst of life's greatest tragedies. Gift number one that God gives us through his son, Jesus Christ. Write this down with me. Through Jesus, we are guaranteed resurrection from the dead. Through Jesus, we are guaranteed Resurrection from the dead. You know what resurrection from the dead means? Resurrection from the dead in Christ means that the worst thing is not the last thing. Amen? That's what that means. The worst thing is not the last thing. It, it's, it's a sleep. It's a nap. 
That God, God will raise your body from to be with him always. Look what Paul says in verse 15. He says, for this we declare to you by a word or by the word from the Lord that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. It means we don't, we don't have an advantage. Those of us, if Christ returned right now, then we who are alive and in Christ, we don't have an advantage over our brothers and sisters in Jesus who have already died. So it seems like the Thessalonians may have, may have believed in some way that, that they believe so much in the imminent return of Christ, the immediate return of Christ, that in their mind it seems that they had thought that if you were dead at the coming of Christ, you just missed the boat. You're just not going to be included in the kingdom of God. Boy, doesn't that shortchange the promises of God? Doesn't that shortchange the power of God that he would need us to be alive? in order to have us be part of his kingdom? He doesn't need that. This is the God who wakes up a valley of dry bones with a wind. He doesn't need us to be alive in order to bring us into his kingdom. He can give us life and bring us into his kingdom. And that's exactly what he do, does. So we who are alive, who remain at his coming, will not proceed. We have no advantage. In fact, we won't even get a head start. We won't even get a head start he says, we will not precede those who have fallen asleep. Verse 16, for the Lord himself will descend. You remember in Acts chapter 1, verse 11, the disciples, they're all standing there with, another, with a large group of people and believers. And they're watching as Jesus, he tells them, you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the world. He gives them this commission and, and he's going to send them out. And then he ascends into heaven in the clouds. And, and these men of Galilee are staring up into the heavens and they no longer then see Jesus. And you remember that the angels appear to those men and they say, men of Galilee, why do you look into the heavens? This Jesus who was taken away from you he will also descend in like manner. He, he will come back. So what are you saying? He said, you've got work to do in the meantime. You've got a mission to complete. You've got that Acts 1-8 mission to complete before Jesus returns. But the same way he ascended is the way that he will descend. He says in verse 16, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven. Now this is a difference. When Jesus ascended into heaven, there were not millions of people watching on. There were not thousands of people watching on. There were hundreds of people watching on, but it was no massive crowd. But when Jesus descends from heaven, it will not be a secretive event. I want you to note that in your mind. If anything Paul does in this passage telling us about the coming of Christ in this relation, he tells us that there is nothing secretive about it at all. In fact, it sounds, it sounds like the beginning of war. And if we were preaching on the end times in that way, I would describe to you the war that will take place at the return of Christ. But this is war sounds that take place at his return. They don't bring us fear. They bring us joy and salvation. Listen to what he says. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command. Charge. Something like that. With a cry of command. With the voice of an archangel. Not just any angel. In Jude verse 9, we are told that Michael is an archangel. There's some sort of hierarchy amongst the angels of God. And so there is a responsibility given to one of, the, one of the leading sergeants in the army of God to issue this cry of command, this voice of command, with the voice of an archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God. Why would they blow the trumpets in those days? To announce the movement of an army. With the trumpet, the sound of the trumpet of God, and here it is. Here's the army. And the dead in Christ will rise first. There's your army. Dead people died in Jesus. 
God's going to raise them up from the dead, and they will return with him. Amen? Through Jesus, we are guaranteed resurrection from the dead. Listen to how the apostle Peter describes this. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. He says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. We have a a living hope through Jesus. You got to imagine that cry of command, that, that shout of the archangel, that blast of the trumpet for those who are not prepared, for those who are not in Christ, you can imagine that will be one of the most terrifying moments of their eternity, only to be trumped by the time that they stand or kneel before the judgment seat of Christ. That will be a terrifying day for the nations who are not prepared for his coming. For us, it is our living hope. That's what seasons us with this kind of joy and expectation of the future. In the New Testament, in the Gospels, Jesus talked quite extensively about his return. Listen to how Jesus describes this day, Matthew chapter 24. Verses 29 through 31, notice what he says there in that very first phrase. Immediately after the tribulation of those days. Immediately after the tribulation, not before the tribulation, not before that time of great distress. This will be after that time of great distress. What is it that gets us through the suffering of this world in the great tribulation? What is it that gets us through these wars and rumors of wars and the raging of the nations and these nasty politics and people killing people by the millions? What is it that gets us through that? It's not a secretive rapture that makes us escape from it. It is a living hope that carries us through it and gives us the persevering endurance to make it through it with faith. It is this hope that at the return of Christ, we will be raised from the dead, and this is a militaristic call for Jesus to set up his kingdom here on this earth. That's our hope. Jesus says immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man and then all the tribes of the earth, here's what they'll do, they will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory and he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call. Sounds like the same event, doesn't it? He will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. What a glorious future expectation that we have. The promise of resurrection from the dead. Now let me tell you, there's more to it. There's more to it. It's not just that God raises us from the dead in Christ. Listen to what else he says. There's really three more gifts that I want to point out to you from verse 17. Verse 17, I think there there are three little phrases in here. They ought to fill you with such hope this morning. It says in verse 17, 17, Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. I want to slow down for just a moment, and I want us to think about those words. He says, then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with, with who? What does he say? What's that pronoun he uses? We will, we will be caught up together with, with them. That, that's an interesting pronoun, isn't it? We who are alive, who remain. You know, I don't know. I, I, I don't know if I will be alive. I don't know if, if you will be alive 
at the returning of Christ? I don't know. If the Lord tarries or if the Lord takes me home, I, I, I could be dead. I don't know. And maybe my family will, will, will mourn and be sorrowful for me. Maybe some of you will be, hopefully many of you, be sorrowful and mourn. Maybe your families, maybe you won't be alive. Are you at a disadvantage? Will you be at a disadvantage because you died before Christ returned? What about the sorrow and that ache that, that you feel about your, your loved ones in Jesus who have passed? How many of you long to see, see one of them right now? You wish that you could walk out into the foyer, grab your phone, and call them. But you can't today. He says, then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them. With them. Who is them? Them is the they who loved Jesus and died before his return. And we will be caught up together with them. Did you hear me? We will be caught up together with them. Gift number two, through Jesus, we will one day be reunited with fellow believers. Don't let that point miss you. Through Jesus, we will one day be reunited with fellow believers. Amen. I, I know that I will see my grandfather and my grandmother and my other grandfather. And I'm going to see my great-grandparents that I never got to meet. I'm going to get to see them. And if the Lord tarries his return, I, I, there may be other relatives that I'm going to have to wait to see again at that great family reunion when Christ returns. Let me tell you, this was the hope. This was the hope of David. I don't know that David understood I don't know that David understood all of, the, all of the implications of the resurrection from the dead, but David's theology was correct. Even, even in its seed form, his theology was correct. When David had sinned with Bathsheba committing adultery with her, you remember she became pregnant. She became pregnant and she had a child. You remember the Lord's uh, consequence to David for his sin was that that child would die. And so the child became sick very sick, an infant. And while that child, while that baby was sick, it says that David mourned and David wept and David lamented and he would not bathe himself. He would not eat. He would not dress himself. He's just wearing sackcloth and putting ashes and dirt on his head. And he's pouring out his heart day and night for this little baby who is approaching death, pleading with the Lord for mercy. I mean, this is such a spectacle that's going on that, that David's servants would not even talk to him about it. And then one day, the child dies. And all the servants are fearful. They're fearful to go to David and tell him that this baby has died. Because they say, David, David has already wounded himself so deeply. It's evident in his visage. It's evident in his person. He is mourning deeply. And we're afraid that if we tell him that this child has died, he's going to hurt himself. And so they don't know what to do. Listen to what it says. Read 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 18 through 23. It says, On the seventh day the child died. And the servants of David were afraid to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, Behold, while the child was yet alive, we spoke to him, and he did not listen to us. How then can we say to him, The child is dead? He may do himself some harm. But when David saw that his servants were whispering together, David understood that the child was dead. And David said to his servants, Is the child dead? And they said, He is dead. Listen to this. Then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his clothes. And he went into the house of the Lord and worshiped. He then went to his own house. And when they asked, or when he asked, they set food before him and he ate. Isn't that strange? Then his servants said to him, what is this thing that you have done? 
You fasted and wept for the child while he was alive, but when the child died, you arose and ate food. He said, note this, while the child was still alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, who knows whether the Lord will be gracious to me and the child may live. But now he is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he will not return to me. Nobody in David's household understood this. They, they didn't understand that, that David was mourning and weeping so the child would be healed. But David had a hope that he would be reunited with this child one day. How much more we who have the fullness of the gospel exposed and explained to us through the revelation of God's word. And now we know with a certain hope, we don't have to be ignorant like David's servants. We, we can know that those who have died in Christ, who have gone before us, we will be caught up together with them. We will be with them. You will see, if you are in Christ and that loved one was in Christ, you will see them again. Amen? You better make sure that you are right with the Lord. That's the only way you're going to see those loved ones who are in Christ. That's the only way that you will see them again is if you are in Christ. What a shame. Dads, moms, wouldn't it be such a shame? Your children all give their life to the Lord. They love Jesus. You bring them to church, you drop them off at church because it's good for them. It'll shape them into a good person. It's good for their heart. But you yourself, you've kind of gone past that. You don't really need that anymore. And guess what? If your faith is not in Jesus, you have a different eternal destination than your children do. How is that being a good parent? How, how is that truly expressing your love to your children? That they have a different eternal destination than you do. Why not just make it right? Why not just make it right with the Lord and guarantee that your family will be together forever? We will be caught up together with them. Now, he adds a little bit more. Keep looking at verse 17. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. To meet the Lord in the air. We worship Jesus now. How? We worship him by, by faith, not by sight. Nobody in here, we've never seen Jesus. We've never seen Jesus at any time. The people who saw Jesus face to face, they have long since passed away from this earth. But when Christ returns, if you are in him, guess what? You will meet the Lord in the air. The one you worship by faith will now then become your sight. Gift number three, through Jesus, not only will we, re, will we be reunited with fellow believers, but we will be united with him. Through Jesus, we will one day be united with him. No longer praying prayers, just having face-to-face -face conversations. You ever thought about that? No longer having to bow your knees and close your eyes and speak to the Lord spiritually because you don't see him presently. Now you just open your eyes and you talk to the Lord face-to-face. -face. And you've got these brothers and sisters in Christ all around you. What a glorious day that we have to look forward to. Resurrection from the dead, reunited with fellow believers, united with Christ. But listen to what else he says. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And here it is. And so we will always be with the Lord. Always. 
that eternal state of reunion with fellow believers, of union with Christ, of a resurrection body that will not perish. We already read 1 Corinthians 15, that the perishable will put on imperishability, the corrupt will put on incorruptibility, that which is dying will be swallowed up with life, and that will be our eternal state. Gift number four, through Jesus, we will receive eternal life in the kingdom of God. Eternal life. Wouldn't that be somewhat hellacious? If we got to experience all those things, but it wasn't for eternity, that we got a taste of that glory. We got a taste of that insurpassable pleasure and joy. And then God said, it's over, time's up. That, that would be maybe more tormenting than anything, to have known that kind of pleasure and then to no longer experience it. But the promise of God is that we will be in that state for all eternity in the kingdom of God. Listen to how the book ends. Revelation chapter 22, verses 1 through 5. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also, on either side of the river, the tree of life, which we were forbidden to eat from when Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden. He says, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruits, yielding its fruit in each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. Through Jesus, we will receive eternal life in the kingdom of God. Now, what, what is the result of a right perspective on the resurrection. What's the result of this? Look at verse 18. He gives us a command. He says, therefore, encourage one another with these words. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. That's a command. That's not an option. What is our responsibility toward one another when a brother or sister in Christ passes from this life? What is our responsibility as a church family? Sure, we want, to, we want to gather around them and we want to love them. You know that our responsibility is a responsibility of reminder to, to pull them aside and say, I know that you, you are grieving. I know that you're sorrowful. I know that you're hurting. And I wish I could take that away from you, but I can't. I love you. I'm here for you. But let me just remind you, you remember how they lived in this life. You remember how they loved Jesus. And you remember the promise of God, don't you? So, so let your sorrow, let your sorrow be mitigated by this hope, this hope that they will be raised, that you will be lifted up with them you will meet the Lord in the air and you and I will be with them and the Lord forever and always. You can get through today. You can make it. You can get through this funeral and you can get through tomorrow and the next coming years as you seek to, to, to deal with that, that grief. You just make sure that you don't grieve as those who have no hope because we do. It says, therefore, encourage one another with these words. That's the result of a resurrection perspective. Through Jesus and his promise of resurrection, our sorrow is seasoned with hope. And we have hearts full of courage. Let me leave you with one more passage of scripture. Revelation 21, verses three through four. John says, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, 
And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Because we do lament and we do mourn, don't we? We just don't do it without hope. But in that day in the resurrection, death is swallowed up in victory. Death loses its sting. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. That's what's going to die in the end. All of these former things. Amen. For we who believe in Jesus, this gives us hope, doesn't it? But for those who don't believe in Jesus, and there I'm sure there are some who are here today, You maybe know about Jesus. You you do now. I've told you very clearly. But this reality of the resurrection doesn't give you hope. It leaves you left out. But you know why you're left out? You're not left out because God has left you out. You're left out because you refuse to follow the Lord. I remember what Matthew Henry wrote a long time ago. He says, the gospel excludes none, but they that exclude themselves. The gospel excludes none, but they that exclude themselves. If you want that hope, it's right there for you. It's as near as a word on your mouth is what the apostles say. It's on your tongue. If you will confess that Jesus is Lord and you will believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You'll be included in that hope. You who are far off, you will be brought near into the family of God. Guaranteed resurrection, guaranteed reunion with fellow believers, union with Christ and everlasting life with him and his kingdom. Let's pray.